probably um, uh, the most comprehensive, analytical, and passionate um, argument in opposition to Article 5 that I have yet heard. And um, I'm going to make sure that I get a copy of the video of that and take it to my colleagues in South Carolina because South Carolina, um, South Carolina is one of those states that is currently um, pushing, or there are a group of individuals, um, individuals who purport to be, you know, liberty uh, candidates or uh, advocates. Um, and so we have to be vigilant in pointing out what the uh, deficiencies and dangers of an Article 5 convention are. So um, I stand in opposition to it in South Carolina. I don't think you have South Carolina to worry about. It does worry me what I just heard um, from Evan about the, uh, the number of states that are uh, actually passing it. So um, thank you for that excellent, excellent um, uh, exposition on that. Yes, sir. Her blog has got everything on the planet. On it, about anything, all the foundings, uh, constitution, everything you can think of. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, a little bit about myself before I start, and I'm not going to stand between you and lunch too long. Um, I'm an attorney by, by training. Um, I got into politics in 2002 when I helped my uh, college friend Mark Sanford run for governor. I was campaign manager for him. Um, I then went up and became chief of staff for Governor Sanford. Uh, for several years and then I ran for Senate myself in 2008 and I'm now in my seventh year in the South Carolina State Senate um, and you know I, I can talk I'm going to talk a little bit in, in more practical terms you've heard some great theoretical expositions from the prior two speakers in regard to um, the intellectual foundations for nullification or resistance and, and I would second everything uh, that they've said um, but I'm going to give you some practical instances of how we've been able to advance that particular cause in South Carolina and in some places where we failed to advance it and what I think we can do to get it to do better in the future. Um, first of all, in regard to our country's future and in regard to uh, the centralization of power, which has really been, been fairly quick, beginning with the New Deal and accelerating with the Good Society and, and, and getting to the point now where um, the federal government indeed is tyrannical. Um, but so, although I'm short-term pessimistic for those reasons, um, long-term I'm optimistic, and let me, let me tell you why. Um, I believe that the federal government is on a path to fiscal ruin that it can't, it can't reverse at this point. And, um, and, and why I say that, let's look at the national debt. We all know that it's in excess of $17 trillion now. Uh, we all realize that annual deficits, that used to be a trillion dollars a year annual deficits until a couple years ago, it's now down to about $500, $600 uh, billion a year, and we're supposed to feel like that's progress. But it's, it's projected to go back up to $1 trillion again, annual deficits again in two or three more years. So um, that's bad enough, but, but if you really get under the hood and look at what's happening uh, in regard to that deficit and debt situation, uh, it, it really makes the situation more dire, and, and, and you can understand why. Um, how, you must ask yourself, can the federal government continue to operate when it's collecting about a half trillion dollars less than it actually spends? I mean, no household could withstand for long doing that. I mean, if you did, you'd file bankruptcy at Chapter 7, and you'd have to wash out the debts and, and, and move on with your life. Um, the way the federal government is able to keep those doors open uh, is every week the U.S. Treasury goes into the bond market um, and it sells debt instruments to the public. And that's the way it raises money, borrows money, to cover up that deficit. Now, who purchases those debt instruments? Well, increasingly, they're primary dealers like Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan. And what they do is once they buy those Treasury securities, they immediately turn it around and then sell it at a profit to the Federal Reserve, which creates more money in order to purchase those, uh, those uh, treasury instruments and puts it in their portfolio. So the treasury, I mean, the, the Federal Reserve has effectively for the past seven years operated in that way to fund the deficit spending. We have quadrupled the monetary base in our country over the past seven years. Four times the amount of money is now either in circulation or held by banks and excess reserves than seven years ago. And so the question you have to ask yourself if we're running trillion dollar deficits as of two or three years ago, and half trillion dollar deficits now, and it's going to be a trillion dollars in the future, and that's being financed 
by the Federal Reserve printing more and more money, at some point in time, that house of cards is going to crumble. At some, at some point in time, um, that pyramid scheme or that, that, that scam is going to collapse because economic realities are going to catch up with what the Federal Reserve is doing. A consequence of that, I submit to you, is going to be the federal government having to, as a matter of financial necessity, reversing its trend and cutting its spending out of sheer necessity. That's going to be less money coming of your money that goes to the federal government that comes back for roads and education and health care. That cost is going to be turned off. And states at that point in time, in my judgment, are going to have to call upon to do more for their constituents than they have heretofore done. They're not going to have the federal government or that money. That's a very healthy thing, in my judgment. As Washington, D.C. collapses, and as the state has to step up and start and, and take its rightful place in terms of, of offering and helping out its citizens, and as that collapse happens, the federal government becomes even more delegitimized. Some of these resistance measures that we're talking about today, whether it's nullification, whether it's any of the other um, themes or, or, um, or, or uh, examples of resistance, are going to be more acceptable to people and more acceptable to state legislators. Because uh, the gentleman that spoke earlier is right, and today, still, legislators, even conservative legislators in the General Assembly in South Carolina, feel like talking about nullification is, is sort of right-wing coop talk. And, and, they, and they go back and they recite, as you well know, Marbury versus Madison, where Chief Justice Marshall, you know, you served under the federal branch, you know, the right to declare solely whether or not acts of Congress were constitutional. And it talks about whether or not Congress has passed a law and whether or not its constitutionality has been upheld by the Supreme Court. And for them, that's the end of the inquiry. And they don't even talk about all the things that Publius and the other gentlemen talked about earlier. But as Congress and the federal government becomes even more delegitimized, and as that money coming down from Washington, D.C. starts to dry up because of financial necessity, you're going to find a lot more legislators willing to go ahead and start to take back some of those powers. So short term, I'm pessimistic, but long term, I really think that our founders set up a theory of constitutional Republican governance that will see us through this crisis. We don't need a new constitution. We don't need amendments. We have got a theory or a structure of government that will enable us to continue even stronger if and when, and as I think is ultimately you know, inevitable, the federal government implodes under its own weight. And that's going to be powers coming back to the states and states doing more and individuals you know, you know, gaining more responsibility under themselves. Now, let me talk about what we've done in South Carolina because I've offered several bills, some of which have been successful and some unsuccessful, in regard to, quote, nullification. Um, and when I say nullification, it's, it's with a small N, because I'm talking about a whole range of things that I think legislatures can do to resist what the federal government has imposed. Okay, so there's no one thing. I think there's a range of things. Uh, two things we did last year is we passed, um, for the first time in South Carolina, a medical marijuana law. Um, that, that allows a um, derivative of cannabis um, called CBD oil, um, which is low in THC content, it's got 0.3% THC, but it's high in CBD. We have made it legal for doctors to authorize patients to take that who have epilepsy. And we have seen instances where children with uh, seizures of up to 150, 200 an hour now by taking this derivative of cannabis is in the single digits, absolutely changed lives. Now, we did that despite the fact that the federal government in the Controlled Substances Act says that cannabis and all products related to cannabis is a Schedule I drug and is prohibited for use by the states. Well, we passed that unanimously last year uh, in the Senate and went over to the House and it passed by about a 6 to 1, 7 to 1 margin in the House and was signed by the governor. Um, after that was done, I went to my Democratic friends in the Senate and I said, you realize you just nullified a federal law? And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you, you, you've gone ahead and you've now said that doctors in South Carolina can authorize for use by their epilepsy patients a substance that federal law directly says is illegal and cannot be used. And they were absolutely stunned because these were the same Democrats that very same year that were resisting my bill to nullify Obamacare. That were resisting, that were that were mocking my attempts to nullify Obamacare by saying well, it was unconstitutional and you're a white right wing nut and, and you don't even know constitutional law. And, but they didn't realize 
that they themselves participated in nullification. So the lesson I brought out of that first example I'm going to give you here is that if you focus on an issue, and if you bring personal in individuals to come in and talk about how a particular law or prescription is negatively affecting their lives, and you go ahead and you do what the gentleman said, you make yourself seen, you make yourself heard, you contact your legislator, you focus on that issue, a lot of times legislators will act without even knowing they're nullifying the federal government. They'll just simply be doing what's in the best interest of South Carolinians. So if you're encountering resistance, and a lot of times you will, to the nullification argument in theory, don't argue it in those terms. Don't, don't go up there and argue it in theoretical, we have the right as states to do this, and this is why, and this is what the northern states did with the Fugitive Slaves Act, and this is what, um, you know, in South Carolina you can say, what John C. Calhoun said. Um, it's, it's, it's better, I think, to focus on how your constituents are being hurt, whether it's in regard to gun rights, whether it's in regard to health care, whether it's in regard to education, any number of things, and focus in on how their lives are not being made better by virtue of a law or a regulation or restriction, and get defeated on those terms. So you don't necessarily have to broadcast what you're doing. Um, the second thing I've learned is this, and I had success with this last year in regard to an NDAA um, quote-unquote nullification bill. Uh, there is a United States Supreme Court decision called Prince versus the United States, that's P-R-I-N-T-Z versus the United States, which was decided, I think, about 20 years ago. And it had to do with the Brady gun bill. Remember Brady who got, who got shot back when Reagan got shot, and then he became an advocate for you know, uh, federal gun laws and, and restricting handguns, and, and, and that passed. And um, part of the Brady gun bill, uh, in addition to, to setting forth certain restrictions in regard to guns, it obligated the states to go ahead and carry out certain provisions of that federal act. Well, that was challenged. That was challenged in the Supreme Court. Um, and the argument uh, by the state was, you, the federal government, can't treat the states as if they are merely political subdivisions of the federal government. It's not like the state directing down the counties. You can't make states the administrative arm of your laws. Now, you may or may not be able to pass a law but even if you pass laws that are within the enumerated powers that Ubley has talked about, that does not by implication mean that the states have to spend their money and, and direct their employees to carry out federal laws. It's called anti-commandeering. And, and Justice Scalia wrote really a very good opinion in, in the Prince case saying that even if you are talking about um, Article I powers that Congress has properly uh, uh, followed, and even if you are talking about a law that's been upheld by the United States Supreme Court, it does not follow from that that you as a state are obliged to use your treasure or direct your employees to implement that federal law. So I guess in other words, if you want to characterize this, it's almost like passive resistance or, or refusal to aid and abet. And the dirty little secret is this, the federal government counts on the states and, and their employees and their organizational structure to implement their laws. They, they don't, not yet anyway, they don't have a, a massive uh, federal bureaucracy that can implement everything they pass. They depend upon states to voluntarily assist them in that regard. So what we were successful last year in the Senate in passing in regard to NDAA is saying we are not going to direct, and in fact the law that I drafted and we passed it in the Senate, it failed in the House unfortunately, it said that any law passed by the federal government that denies citizens uh, uh, their due process rights in regard to a trial, we are not going to have any state money or any state resources or any state employees uh, exerting anything to help in that regard. And, um, and that passed in the Senate and failed in the House. I, I'm disappointed that it failed in the House because it, it really should be a theory of constitutional governance that nobody disputes. I mean, does anybody honestly think that states can be compelled by the federal government to tax their citizens um, to go ahead and implement a federal law. I mean, Justice Scalia struck down that part of the Supreme Court, uh, with Justice Scalia writing the majority opinion, struck down in Prince that part of the federal of the Brady Gun Bill. I think that that whole doctrine of anti-commandeering anti can be effective in a whole lot of things, whether it's in regard to, to federal educational dictates, federal health care dictates, you know, federal uh, uh, strictures in regard to environmental regulation. I mean, they depend on the state 
to implement those laws. And so I think anti-commandeering is a way for us um, to, to go ahead and disable and render impotent laws passed by the federal government. Um, we didn't have success in that regard with the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. Um, I introduced that and argued that on the floor of the Senate. Um, and I said, for purposes of argument, I said, okay, um, let's, let's assume, I mean, I recognize the fact that Congress passed the Affordable Care Act. I mean, let's, we, we can talk about, you know, the, the lack of due diligence they did, but they, they passed it. And we can concede the fact that President Obama signed into law, and also the United States Supreme Court upheld um, most of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act in, in the first Supreme Court case of a few years ago. Now, it did strike down certain portions in regard to mandatory expansion of Medicaid, but, but it upheld a lot of the Affordable Care Act. Um, that does not mean, I argue to the Senate, um, that we have to assist in any way in enrolling people in exchanges. Um, and in fact, my law said that nobody with health and human services and no state employee is going to do anything in order to assist somebody in enrolling in a federal exchange, because we don't have a state-created exchange in, in South Carolina, it's a federal exchange. Um, and that argument, not my, it, it failed, even in a, a Senate where there's 28 Republicans and 18 Democrats, that failed. And, and I was absolutely shocked by that, but, but then I un undercut, understood the reason why. Blue Cross and Blue Shield in South Carolina, the state's largest insurer, makes money off of the Affordable Care Act. And they had legislators, Republican legislators, you know, influenced to vote that down. I mean, I was very embarrassed for my state at that point in time because South Carolina has a reputation for being jealously guarding of its own powers. It historically has uh, the view in the nation's eyes as being a state that's going to stand up for its rights against an encroaching federal government. And yet, a bill that said we're not going to spend state dollars or enlist state employees to implement the provisions of the Affordable Care Act failed in a Republican-controlled Senate. And I, and I think that did us discredit. And every chance I get on that Senate floor, I stand up and remind my colleagues of that fact because I don't want voters to forget it next year when they go back to the polls. Um, in regard to um, Fourth Amendment, I think Publius has talked about it or somebody talked about the nullification laws in regard to Fourth Amendment. I filed that this year. It is in the Senate Judiciary, and it says that, again, once again, the anti-commandeering approach South Carolina courts, South Carolina money, South Carolina employees are not going to participate in the implementation of any federal program which denies individuals their Fourth Amendment rights in a, in a, uh, in a proceeding. Um, and again, that's encountering the same sort of tepid, you know, response um, that the Affordable Care Act anti-commandeering provision did. But um, I'm ever hopeful, and, and I think that this discussion is extraordinarily important because it serves a number of purposes. One, it educates people as to what the Constitution actually says. Second, it gives us an opportunity to point out in real life terms how Congress is overstepping its bounds. And, and, and thirdly, it goes ahead and it starts to condition people to think in terms of the state is rightfully the representative agency that's to address some of these areas that Congress has stepped in and just usurped the power. You know, Congress has said, as Publius has indicated, they, they, you know, the Supreme Court has broadly interpreted the Interstate Commerce Clause, the General Welfare Clause, the Necessary and Proper Clause, um, and they have given a cloak of legitimacy um, to the overstepping that Congress has engaged in, really since the New Deal, and then accelerated by the Great Society, and continuing to this day. And so people need to be re-educated as to the idea that, no, the federal government can't do everything it wants, and in fact, you ought to be very suspicious of anything it does and skeptical and ask yourself, okay, under what authority does it claim to have the power to do this? Condition them to think in those terms and condition them to think of the terms of the federal government only has these enumerated powers, that the state states are the ones with plenary powers, and that if, if you're going enter, to enter into the safety and welfare and, and, and things of that nature, education, that's a state function. Okay, and so we're educating them as to that because I think inevitably, and again, I come back to where I started, um, I think that in five years' time, max, given the rate that's projected in terms of our deficits, given the amount of federal debt we now have, and given the nature of what the Federal, of the federal Reserve has done, 
we're going to see a collapse. And, and, and the Federal Reserve, and I'm going to make this one other point too, and, and this is, I learned this from Ron Paul, and Ron Paul is somebody I endorsed in 2012 for president, um, and I did so because he was talking about these issues to a degree and to an extent that I don't think anybody else was. But what he pointed out, and what I subsequently confirmed for myself, is that when the Federal Reserve creates new money, when it creates money out of thin air, and obviously that decreases the value of everybody's dollars in their bank, right? You increase, you know, what the Federal Reserve did with that money for the first time in history, starting in 2008, 2009, 2010, as they just weren't buying government securities to finance the deficit, they were going into private banks like J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs, and they were buying toxic assets. They were buying assets that were um, that were you know way below par value. I mean, they may have a par value of X, but their value may have been X minus whatever given the market. But the Federal Reserve would create new money and step in and buy those toxic assets at par from those banks bailing them out and making bad loans. And so they've got a portfolio now full of toxic assets. How are you going to suck money back out of, of, the, um, of the economy by selling these assets? Because traditionally, that's what they do. I mean, they would sell assets if they want to go ahead and decrease the monetary supply. Money would come back and they would destroy the currency. How are you going to do that if you went ahead and purchased at par assets that are worth about 50% of that? You're not going to be able to. And so things are going to collapse. States need to be ready for that. States need to be aware of their rights. Citizens need to be aware that this is a chance for us to take our power back. So what I see as a short-term, you know, horrendous situation is an opportunity for a long-term restructuring of the balance of power shifting back to where our founders intended it to be. And then thenceforth, we have to be vigilant about that when things start to circle back up again, recover again, to not letting power go back um, to the federal government. And that's where we have to be vigilant about who we send up to Congress. We have to be absolutely, you know, insistent that they keep Congress to those enumerated powers. So short-term pain, long-term I'm optimistic. Um, everybody has their role to play. So thank you all for letting me speak. Um, I think it's seven minutes after 12. I'll be happy to answer. I know lunch is at 12.10, um, but I'll be happy to answer one or two yeah, questions please, if anybody yeah, has please. any. Yes, sir. I've got a good example of what you're saying about them passing it back to the states. Uh, the Virginia, I'm from Virginia, and Virginia legislature's already told the counties that uh, that you're going to have to take the roads uh, down the road. Mm -hmm. They've already said that, so they know it's coming. So, yes. Yes, sir. I'm not from North Carolina. I'm from South Carolina. Yes, sir. But I, I'm curious. I'm of the same mindset of the collapse of things. How does that play into because you know there's got to be some things that's going to come along with that civil unrest and things of that nature how do you feel with regards to uh, obama uh trying to frame dhs and, and or bring the local law enforcement and things like that under dhs what's the response there because that's going to get kind of hairy if you're going to try to do the other and they've already sort of moved their pieces you're, you, and you make a good point. The assumption I'm making is this, and, and what you're saying is it may not be a valid assumption. The assumption I'm making is this, is that as the federal government implodes and as the transfer payments that come back to the state now for roads and, and, uh, and education and health care, that, that states will then go ahead and reassert uh, you know, uh, their, their rightful place in those areas and the citizens will, will acknowledge the fact that states are doing that and things will restore themselves to a balance that's much healthier. What you're saying is, there may be something else that arises out of that chaos. There, there may be an attempt by uh, the federal government to impose its will or to do things other than that devolution of power and, and responsibility. Um, I hope that's not the case. I mean, and, and but but you know nobody has you know 2020 high, uh, sight as to what's going to happen in the future. I guess I should say this. I see it as an opportunity for us to correct the balance of power. I see it as an opportunity for us to take power that the federal government have been exercising and have it in a trifle place. But you're right to caution us in terms of the federal government, once it has power, it's probably going to be reluctant to relinquish it. And it may well do things uh, to interpose that, what I see a natural uh, move of authority moving back to the state. So that's an excellent an excellent cautionary point that you raised, sir. Yeah, that's, sir, sir uh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that was just some of the things that I see, especially with the strings being tied to the federal government giving local law enforcement sheriffs some of these vehicles that they've been using 
I mean, we're not a war zone here. And, and I didn't talk about that enough, but 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 the federal strings uh, are, are something that is deserving of, of a brief mention here to myself. Um, Congress already has broadly overstepped their bounds. We know that. But what they do is, even in areas where they themselves will say, we have no business, they'll step into it and say to the states, well, this is voluntary, you don't have to do it, but if you don't do it, then you're going to lose billions of dollars. So, so that's a way that, that, even though there's an expansive reading of the Constitution, and even though Congress has aggregated unto itself powers it doesn't have, even as the powers that anybody would acknowledge they don't have, they get anyway by virtue of tying those dollars and strength. So, if you, I mean, and, and I've talked about this to, to my friend Mark Sanford is in Congress now, and to Mick Mulvaney and other people in Congress. I said, you guys have to stop these federal programs with strings. Um, I, mean, I mean, even if you make them voluntary, and that's the argument you make to get around the constitutional constraints by saying, well, this is voluntary, we're not making states do that. By the fact of attaching all that money to it, you have effectively de facto assumed that power. And so we've got to stop that particular method of circumventing the Constitution as well. Um, yes, sir, I'll get to you. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, the, the other problem is uh, uh, the, uh, the possibility that uh, other countries might might take over in, in the power vacuum. Say China, that's a possibility. Also entities like uh, the Federal Reserve, which Owns as much debt as uh, as uh, as China, or or uh, there have been stories that uh, if uh, someone in Google has a lapse lapse of judge lapse of sanity, what's to stop them from taking control in some way too? Well, you're right, and, and, and to the extent that you're in debt as a nation, um, there is going to be some authority or power given to your creditor. I mean, there, there's absolutely no question in that regard, sir. Some of what you talked about, where the uh, Republicans finally took control of uh, North Carolina General Assembly, and did some studies in the quote education system, quote, public education, and discovered that North Carolina was spending twice as much complying with federal regulations, Department of Education, as they were getting in funds for the Department of Education. So it was a losing proposition, but they were so greedy to get federal money. That, that they sold their souls to the federal devil for this. And that's why, that's why I remain optimistic that when this federal implosion comes, and I think it is coming, the very first thing they're going to cut is going to be the transfer payments back to the states for highway dollars, for education, for health care. With the cutting of those funds, the faucet being turned off, I think presents the states with an opportunity to reassert their, their, their rightful place in regard to those areas. Although I'm mindful of what the gentleman said up here, it may go the other way. The federal government may employ methods I don't even want to contemplate to hold on to that control. Our governor and legislature will have to go to work. At that point, we have militias and we have National Guard. Uh, in a collapse like that, the citizens' life and property, health, are all at risk, and our legislature and our governor would have to protect us through militias and national guard. And it also underscores what Putin has said about the purpose of the Second Amendment. And it's not to protect the rights of hunters, it's to allow the individual to protect himself from one of the state. states. So it's, it's, it goes right back to that. I, I second report and file in that result. Yes, sir. One of the strong takeaways is the Sheriff's First program that was mentioned uh, a while back because once you understand the role of the Sheriff as final authority, in your county, and up to and including kicking the feds out if they usurp their their, their authority. Uh, once we understand that, then we now know why DHS is trying to get control over their sheriffs. Right. So you control your sheriff. It's all about us speaking with our sheriffs and getting in touch with them and making sure that they know us and we have a relationship and we have a sheriff that is going to stand yes. for us. And there's a temptation there among local law enforcement if you've got the federal government saying, here, we have this surplus military you know, equipment, why don't you take it? And, and But you, you mean, you're right, that creates a very unhealthy relationship between the locals and the feds, whereas the local law enforcement allegiance isn't necessarily anymore entirely to the citizenry they're tied in with the federal government at that point in time. So it has a, a very negative consequence in that regard as well. Yes, ma'am. I've spoken to my sheriff in my town, and I asked him if it ever came about what it, whether he would um, obey an order from the feds 
or protect our citizens. And he told me, if it's the federal law, I will do the federal law. True. And he, True. so True. he basically told me he won't pay, he won't protect the citizens. Yeah, I'm going to vote him out. Yeah. 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 And there's not a lot we can do about that because so, yes, sir. Uh, President JFK, he uh, realized, I think, this, this problem with the, with the fiat currency that's based on nothing and central bankers just print the money out of thin air. He issued executive order 11110 and it um, had the treasurer, uh, the treasury department, produce money called silver certificates based on gold and silver, which is what the Constitution says we're supposed to have. And so following up on what others have said, have you or your you know, colleagues uh, considered uh, what you would do in a post-dollar collapse? Would you maybe um, create a state bank um, that is then uh, issuing currency um, based on gold and silver or some other option like that? There, there have been um, currency reform legislation filed in, in the General Assembly that's never progressed that far because I think a lot of people, again, um, are just simply unaware of what the Federal Reserve does, what they've done to our currency, how they've jeopardized the dollar reserve status. Um, and you see it in Washington, D.C. now, as the audit the Fed bill is starting to get some traction and the Federal Reserve realizes it's getting some traction. I mean, Janet Yellen and all of her, you know, lieutenants are out there now talking about how this is going to threaten the Federal Reserve's independence and we can't have that happen. I mean, what in the world? Our entire federal constitution in regard to, 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 to centralized power is based on this notion of checks and balances. Our founders feared you know, power that was unchecked. And so how in the world does that argument carry water? That, that the most influential institution in our society should remain independent and above checks and balances? It's just nonsensical. And you have to ask yourself this question. Why does the Federal Reserve not want a forensic audit? Well, I'll tell you this. They don't want the American people to know why they created money out of thin air and went into Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan and bought their toxic assets at par and went ahead and ripped off the rest of the American people. Because when that gets out there, when it's common knowledge about what the Federal Reserve has done to your pocketbook, there's going to be hell to pay. And, and I think, again, we got to go through that hell to pay. we got to go through that. I mean, people say, why do you want to cause that kind of disruption? Markets are going to you know, go crazy. You gotta go through that. It's almost like going to detox. You gotta go through it in order to get better. And, and that's what's gonna have to happen. Because if you don't, you're gonna die, and the market's gonna correct itself. Either way, whether we correct it in a logical, um, you know, or a correctable bubble burst. Exactly. Right. Right. Anyway, I'm, I am now sitting in the way you and lunch, so I'm gonna call it quits. And uh, thank you all very much, and I'm gonna be back on the road to help that. Take care.